Thank you so much for watching It Is Written. On today's program, along with the next few programs, we are going to be addressing an issue that touches almost every family around the world. We're going to be addressing the issue of mental health, specifically the area of depression. And to help me as we have that discussion, I am happy to have Dr. Neil Nedley. Dr. Nedley, welcome to It Is Written. Great to be here, Chris. You know, Dr. Nedley has been an internal medicine doctor for the last 27 years. He's a graduate of Loma Linda University. He specializes in gastroenterology, mental health, and the difficult to diagnose patient. He's actually authored three books, Proof Positive, Depression the Way Out, and The Lost Art of Thinking, along with numerous journal articles. And he is now the president of Weimar Institute. Dr. Nedley, tell me a little bit about Weimar Institute. Well, Weimar Institute is a higher education institute, and so we have a college and educational institution, but the motto of Weimar is to heal a hurting world, physically, mentally, socially, and spiritually. And so part of our educational institution involves a lifestyle center where people come with bad diabetes or heart disease or even cancer. Uh, and they stay for 19 days and get a new start on life. It's actually an acronym that Weimar uh, coined years ago. And uh, we also have a mental health facility that actually runs a depression and anxiety recovery program. This is where we take people with severe depression and anxiety that may not have responded to traditional treatments um, or actually have side effects of traditional treatments. And it's amazing what will happen in just 10 days at that center. Wow. And over the course of the next few shows, we're going to be talking about some of the research, actually, and some of the findings you've had in actually dealing with patients and addressing this issue of depression. Yeah. Now, before we get there, though, where is Weimar Institute located? Weimar Institute is right outside of Sacramento, California. That's Northern California, where the capital is. And it's in the foothills of the Sierra, and it's not too far away from Lake Tahoe. So it's in a beautiful setting. Wonderful. And as we talk about this issue of depression, how big of a problem is depression really? Depression is a worldwide problem. In fact, one of the most prestigious medical, actually scientific journals, not just a medical journal, it's the journal Nature, highlighted this just a few weeks ago with a journal that had the entire issue dedicated to depression. And they mentioned there that we have 400 million people, as we are speaking here today, with major depression worldwide. That's about 6% of the adult population. It's the number one cause of disability in the entire world. More people miss work due to depression than any other condition or even groups of conditions. So it's a major problem. Wow. Now, how about in Canada? This program is aired throughout Canada. How big of a problem is depression in Canada? Depression is a big problem in Canada. Um, and in fact, the complications of depression, even suicide, is a big problem in Canada. And so Canada actually is a little worse than the worldwide statistic. It's actually very similar to the United States as far as its depression incidence, which is um, up there in the top um, 35 uh, countries in the world as far as depression is concerned. Wow. So let's back up just a little bit and just simply ask the question, what is depression? Depression actually is not just being sad. A lot of people think depression is just this deep sadness. That's one symptom, but you actually don't have to have that symptom. You could have emptiness and also qualify for symptom number one. But actually it's a constellation of having at least five of nine symptoms. So the first one, sadness or emptiness. The second one, apathy. This is when you wake up in the morning and you're not excited about the day. You wake up and get up out of a sense of duty and responsibility, but not real interest. Third is actually sleep disturbances. 
and that can occur either way. Depressed people can have insomnia, they can have hypersomnia where they're wanting to sleep all the time, but most commonly they go to sleep okay, but then they wake up too early and can't get back to sleep. Any of those qualify. Fourth symptom is you're more irritable than you used to be, or you've had a slowing of your muscle movements. Either one of those would qualify for symptom number four. Symptom number five is weight or appetite changes, and that can occur either way. A lot of people self-medicate with food, you know, to get comfort food, so they have the weight gain, and then severe sudden onset depression often has anorexia and weight loss. Sixth symptom is lack of concentration. And with that symptom, they'll be reading a newspaper and they get to the bottom of the column and they can't remember now what they read at the top of the column. And so they have to go back up and reread. And it can get so significant that it can affect academic performance, it can even affect memory. And so uh, that tends to be a prominent symptom. Seventh symptom is when it gets more severe, feelings of worthlessness. Okay. The eighth symptom is morbid thoughts. That could be suicidal thoughts, but beyond that, it's just preoccupation with death or symbols of death. People okay. will be tattooing symbols of death on themselves or buying symbols of death. And then the ninth symptom is energy, fatigue. And so you'll run out of energy too early or you'll wake up in the morning without energy. Now you don't have to have all of those symptoms. You just have to have five of nine and you don't have to have them all the time the majority of the time for the last two weeks. But if that's the case, then you actually have major depression. And a lot of people have it and don't even realize it because they may not have the sadness. So about half of the people with major depression in the world are undiagnosed. Okay. And so as you're talking about those different sy symptoms, five of nine, and you've had them regularly over the last two weeks, mm -hmm. and that means that you are symptomatic of having some type of major depression. Mm -hmm. Now, for our viewer who might be watching right now saying, okay, okay, and they're counting them off and saying, right. okay, I've got five, six, seven yeah. of these things, mm -hmm. we are gonna talk over the next few shows on how to address those issues with some very practical, hands-on ways that through watching It Is Written and our dialogue together, they'll actually be able to sense some relief from some of those symptoms. Absolutely. Okay. Now, for the person who is actually counting this, those off, you know, one, two, three, four, five, mm -hmm. that person is going to find hope. Now, if there's somebody watching right now that is in those categories of morbid feelings, suicidal thoughts, there's probably some direct, more direct intervention that they need right now. What should that person do? And we're going to talk about suicide, but somebody who's watching feeling like this is it, like I'm watching this show and after the show is done, I'm going to end my life. That individual, what should they do as they're watching? Well, there's suicide hotlines that okay. they can call and, uh, and talk. But in reality, if the individual actually has a plan to end their own life and they have the means to do it and they're going to do it soon, they really need to check themselves in to an institution. Studies actually show that even if you don't do anything to a person except make sure that they don't do it, you know, they're in a, an environment where they can be watched, in 72 hours those feelings will often pass. Now, what caused those suicidal thoughts might still be there, so they still need to watch the show and they still also <laughs> need to, to get the appropriate treatment. Um, but just if they're having morbid thoughts or, you know, they've contemplated suicide but they're not going to do it, maybe because of their family or other reasons, then, um, then it's very appropriate for them to learn as much as they can from this show and other sources as well as get the treatment that they need. And we'll be making an offer at the end of the show today to receive something in the mail that can actually help them through those first steps of, of overcoming their depressive state. Exactly. Okay. So let's talk about suicide. How big of a, of a problem is suicide? Suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in Canada. And it's the seventh leading cause of death in men. And it's the second leading cause of death in the ages 15 to 24 group in Canada. So if a 15 to 24 year old dies, second most likely cause is them taking their own life in this country. And you and I were talking a little bit before the show 
I'm actually traveling up to Nunavut. Uh, it is written Canada is actually going to be doing some, some both medical and uh, this hope and wholeness to the whole person up in Nunavut. We're going to be doing some work up in Nunavut. You and I were talking actually in Nunavut. How big of a problem is suicide? Yeah, suicide is a major problem in that province. In fact, um, if Nunavut were a country, it would be the second leading suicide rates in the entire world as far as countries are concerned. So it's a major issue there. Uh, but not just that province, there are other provinces, uh, in fact all the provinces in Canada have too high a suicide rate. We know that murder happens far too often in this country, but for every murder, six suicides in Canada. So what are the risk factors then involved, uh, or risk factors for suicide? Well, the risk factors for suicide, particularly feelings of hopelessness. When the individual um, feels as though there's a need in their life mm -hmm. and they don't see how that need's going to be fulfilled, yes. that's often when they get depressed and when they start thinking of what they're going to do about that and often their thinking thoughts, it's actually irrational thoughts, suicide thoughts are, are actually not accurate thinking because there's so many things that they can do uh, often. But often it's because they've elevated something that's a want to a need. You know, they've lost a marriage partner and they think they need a marriage partner. And you know, you can actually live a good long life without being married, you know, you can. Uh, and so there's very few things human beings actually need. They do need food, they need water, you know, we need air. We need sufficient warmth, you know, in Canada in the wintertime, that sure. means we need some shelter. Yes. But, uh, you know, beyond that, there aren't a whole lot of needs, but when we start naming things as needs that aren't, um, and then we don't see how we're going to get that need often, that's when we start thinking along those lines. Okay, and so we have those, those risk factors, and so someone that is suicidal, someone that's feeling that low worth or those putting the needs above actually, or putting wants above the needs, how, how can a person start moving from a state of being suicidal and having these wants L above the needs? What are some things that a person could do that's watching right now today to help them adjust their thinking? And we're going to have a whole show on how to think differently. But just in brief, how can that person start adjusting their thinking to maybe put those in their right order of needs and wants? Well, uh, before I answer that, I would like to also mention some other risk factors because that's what they can do as well. Okay. Um, they don't want to have a frontal lobe suppressant on board, for instance. Studies show that if you are thinking that of hopeless thoughts, and you add something to suppress your frontal lobe, you're much more likely to do it. So half of victims have alcohol on board, or they might have marijuana, or they might have some other you know, drug suppressing their decision-making portion of their brain. So stay away from anything that's going to suppress your brain's ability, number one. Uh, number... Now, now you said... You said Stay away from anything that you mentioned, alcohol. What are some yes. other things that might suppress that frontal lobe, that decision-making? Well, narcotics, you know, heroin can do that, amphetamines can do it, uh, meth, um, cocaine, uh, the benzodiazepines, you know, yeah, taking a, a heavy dose of clonazepam or clonopin or Xanax or those type of things will actually suppress the frontal lobe of the brain and uh, these uh, suicide victims will find this stuff in their bloodstream. Okay. And, and so we're going we're gonna to have a whole show where we're going to talk more about that because I know some people are saying, hey, I've, I've actually had those drugs prescribed to me and we're going to talk about that in a whole show about maybe not having such heavy doses of those. There, there are appropriate times to use those, right. but sometimes we're over-medicated and it suppresses this frontal lobe and actually does the opposite of what it's intended to do. And we'll, we'll talk about that. What are some of the other risk factors? You were going to mention those and I kind of interrupted you. What are some of the other risk factors for suicide? Well, a lack of being able to cope with the frustrations of life. And so learning um, better coping skills would be very important. And then also not isolating yourself. Uh, many depressed people have a tendency to isolate themselves because they think it's the events in their life that have caused their depression, so they want to minimize those events. 
those events are only a partial cause for their depression. It's not just the events, it's what they're thinking about those events. And that's something that we'll get into and in how that can be restructured. But actually, I would encourage them to go to, fortunately, in many of the cities in Canada, they're running a mental health education program called the Nedley Depression and Anxiety Recovery Program. Yes. And they can go there, be in a group of people that have the same things, you know, depression and the same thoughts and that sort of thing. And uh, they'll learn how the brain works how they can take advantage of how the brain works and actually work with others in a group to actually improve um, their brain. Now we've talked about suicide, which is obviously the, the, the most deadly of the, of, the, uh, of the effects of depression, but some effects of depression aren't so deadly. What are some of the other effects of depression on an individual's life? Okay, uh, before that I'd like to mention this. On, on the suicide part, the Please. thing that helps the most is to have the individual realize there are reasons to have hope. And this program alone is enough reason to have hope. I can tell you there's a hundred things, and I'll just speak into the camera, there's a hundred things that you haven't tried that are simple that can improve your mood and also improve your success in life that we're gonna be discussing and talking about. Yes. And so, once you have reasons to have hope, there's no reason to be thinking about ending your life. Okay, and so we'll talk more in depth about that, looking at mm -hmm. some of those hundred things right. that you can hope in. Right. What are some of the not so serious side effects, or not side effects, but serious effects of depression? Well, uh, headache, for instance. Migraine headaches, uh, very common. Um, even tension headaches. Uh, asthma is one of the complications of depression. Uh, decrease in your uh, memory, uh, we kind of mentioned that earlier, yes. but uh, also uh, many people will actually start to go back into a previous addiction. Uh, that can be a complication. And, uh, and then there's things that, that are deadly, like increased risk of stroke and heart attack and even increased risk of pneumonia and cancer. In fact, studies have shown if you have major depression, your longevity is no better than being a cigarette smoker, even though you may not be a smoker. Mm. So um, it's one of the, you know, it's in the top 10 causes of death, um, period, um, in, in the entire world because of the effects on other physical diseases. Uh, and a lot of chronic pain, fibromyalgia type symptoms, often is due to depression and anxiety. Um, loss of bone mineral density, uh, osteoporosis can be due to this. And so uh, that's just a partial uh, list, but there are many different physical symptoms that can result simply from what's going on in the mind. And in brief, Dr. Nedley, and we're going to cover this a little bit more, but in brief, what are some of the causes of depression that may be bringing a person to the points that we've been discussing here over the show? Yes, and that is where my area of expertise I came in, and that was my contribution um, really worldwide to this subject of depression. Uh, as an internal medicine physician, um, we're trained to look for causes. Yes. And so when we see someone with swollen feet, we don't diagnose them with swollen foot syndrome right. and send them out the door with a diuretic prescription. Yes. We look for the cause of the swollen feet. And so when I began to get involved in depression, it, it, there was something missing that was being diagnosed and then immediately medicated and maybe referred for counseling if the medicine didn't work. And so I began to research causes and found well over a hundred causes of depression, most of which can be categorized in 10 different ways. Okay. Now with depression, and this is what we published in the peer-reviewed scientific literature, there are normally four categories of causes before depression or anxiety comes about. That means, Chris, that our brain is pretty resilient. We can be suffering from one of these causes, two of these causes, three of these causes, still function pretty well. But once the fourth category of causes occurs, 
that's when our brain starts to go down significantly into a depression or anxiety mode or both. Okay. And so those 10 categories, just uh, briefly, genetics has yes. a role to play. Yep. The way we're being raised has a role to play, yes. our, our development. Uh, and then we have lifestyle causes like exercise, circadian rhythm causes, addiction causes, nutrition causes, toxic causes, social causes, medical causes, and then finally frontal lobe causes. Those are categories of causes, and it, we can reverse eight out of ten of those in most instances, and that's why depression and anxiety actually has a solution. It can be cured. We're going to be addressing many of those things over the course of the next few shows. But in 20 seconds, Dr. Nedley, somebody's depressed. They've tuned in today. Mm -hmm. What's something that they can do right now to feel a little bit better and get to the next show? where we'll talk about more things they can practically do. Well, first of all, don't put up with depression or anxiety being a lifelong condition. There is a solution, and find it sooner rather than later. And a simple thing that you can do is actually become physically fit. That's one simple treatment that works about as good as an antidepressant medicine without the side effects. We'll get into many more later. And with that, Dr. Nedley, I'm so thankful that you've joined me today. We've run out of time, and we're going to have a short prayer just to encourage those that have been watching today. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for people like Dr. Nedley who can help us, but we are even more thankful that Jesus is the great physician, and we place ourselves into your hands and ask for healing and a way out. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.